Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me for Conversations on Character, Community, and Crisis. This series is part of the Virtues and Vocations Initiative at Duke University, seeking to make character, purpose, and meaning central to education and pre-professional and professional education in particular. My name is Suzanne Shanahan, and I direct the Keenan Institute for Ethics, the institutional home of this series and this initiative. A brief note on logistics. So I know this week lots of people are experiencing Zoom challenges. Uh, please do know that there are several folks from the Institute managing backstage, as it were. So should there be technical difficulties, they are on hand to swiftly address them. Another note, uh, we are going to have a conversation for about 40 minutes and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, folks backstage uh, will be organizing the questions and passing them on directly to me. And with that, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Tressy McMillan Cottom on race, purpose, and purpose in higher education. And I have to note that uh, we are most fortunate to be doing this as a webinar because I know that the many, many fans amongst faculty, staff, and students at the Institute would otherwise be mobbing you. So, <laughs> be I tell you, one, I thank you uh, for the estimation of my, of my prowess. And two, I kind of miss being mobbed at this point in the crisis. <laughs> thank you, Suzanne. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> well, great. I, I promise that when we can have mobs, we'll, we'll invite you to one. To, <laughs> I'm holding to you to it. that. <laughs> Um, so I'm really thrilled to have you here. At the Institute, we talk a lot about combining thinking and doing, and I think you really epitomize that. Um, for folks who don't know Dr. Cottom, uh, she is an associate professor in the School of Information and Library Science, uh, now just recently come to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She's also a research fellow at the Center for Information Technology and Public Life. Her research spans higher education, work, race, class, gender, and digital societies. She is the author of the critically acclaimed, and I'd say revelatory, Lower Ed, The Trouble Rising, The Troubling Rise of For-Profit Colleges in the New Economy. She is also author of Thick and Other Essays, which was a nonfiction finalist for the National Book Awards. And in 2020, she received uh, the American Sociological Association's Public Understanding for Sociology Early Career Award. Her articles in Slate, The Atlanta, and elsewhere have a very loyal following. She also hosts a culture podcast with Roxane Gay, Here to Slay, and lives just down the, down the road, as I said, in Chapel Hill. Um, so welcome, Tressie. We're delighted to have you here. Um, in terms of a game plan for conversation, I reviewed this briefly uh, with you earlier, but just for everyone, I really want to open up with a conversation about lower ed, uh, together with Thick, in a sense, um, to sort of get your understanding of the nature of those arguments, what you're trying to achieve, and how they relate together. Uh, second, um, as we've been doing in many of these conversations, how, how have you been changed and how has your thinking been changed over the past six months? Um, and then just end with a kind of fun, rapid fire um, sort of game of sorts. Seem reasonable? That seems very reasonable. Okay, great. Um, so you are incredibly prolific and you write in many different genres. Um, and so first, how do you think about your work as a body of work, or do you think about it as pieces? That is a wonderful question, and one that I really had to reckon with when I was writing Thick. Um, you know, so prior to that, I, I went through the same professionalization we all go through in graduate school, right? Uh, writing it was something uh, to suffer through. Um, it certainly is subverted to the idea of methods, or you know, or theory. Uh, certainly to the sort of professional impetus to publish, you know, writing at best might be, you know, a top 10 concern, but not really a top five uh, in the profession. And, you know, less true perhaps in some of the humanities, certainly, but in social sciences and sociology in particular, it just is not 
part of the professionalization. Um, but I've always been a writer. Uh, so I saw those uh, for a very long time as two distinct um, sort of uh, professional obligations. There was the obligation I had to uh, academia, and then there was the obligation that I just sort of felt to my creative pursuits and creative talents. Uh, when I sat down to do Thick, there were two questions. Uh, one, uh, you know, my, my editor at the time had come to me and said, we really just think, you know, what your audience or readership wants from you um, is precisely that, this sort of weaving together of where you see yourself intellectually in a journey. So to write Thick, I had to actually consider how do these things <laughs> go together um, and do they? Um, and the challenge and much of what you see in Thick is me resolving that for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I now feel far more comfortable saying I tell empirical stories that matter. That's that, that really is it. I tell, you know, the challenge for me creatively and intellectually is can I interpret data-driven analysis in a way that taps into the power of narrative without compromising the empirical truth, right? So it's always, always constrained by what the data are, what the data are, right? But I know that and have learned, especially over the last couple of years, just how powerful um, narrative narrativizing uh, social issues and social problems are, not just for people's consumption of the ideas, um, but, you know, I spent far more time in Washington, D.C. than I ever would have imagined at the start of my academic career. I had no interest directly in social policy, for example, um, but by virtue of my first job was in Richmond, Virginia. I was just so close to D.C. And then I was doing this work around for-profit higher education, and there was a significant political conversation happening. So I spent a lot of time in D.C. And I remember the first couple times I'd go testify for a subcommittee hearing or Senate or something, just, you know, you know, over preparing on the data, um, over preparing on the, the latest uh, research, wanting to put together this sort of empirical argument. And time and time again, I would get there and, you know, a senator's aide would go, yeah, we just really love you if you could help us shape a story for the committee. Right. The committee needs a narrative and we don't have one. It was stunning to me how much narrative moved social policy in a way that was super meaningful. The reason why we can now talk about student loan debt is because activists came up with this brilliant narrative arc, which was forgive student loan debt. It's a complete story. Forgive the student loan debt. Right. Um, it has a, a clear sort of articulation, and that is what finally got people to respond to this sort of underlying social crisis. So the way I see it now is that they are absolutely part of the same project. Some of that comes with, frankly, being tenured and being in a position where I can make those choices. I want to be fair to junior um, scholars who we don't, when you're junior, don't have quite the same liberties. You have to do what you have to do um, for your job. But now I really do feel quite comfortable moving into new projects and saying that these are part of the the same intellectual project. So that's great. Um, I love there's a section in, in Thick in the lead essay where you talk about this exchange with a senior faculty member when you were still a graduate student mm -hmm. and really cautioning you to kind of get into the mold and get in line mm -hmm. uh, with the expectations of the discipline. And what I find remarkable is that uh, as a sociologist in all your work it is so sociological, right? It's sort of, right? It's the spirit of sociology and the notion of empirical storytelling is just such a compelling one. Um, so I, I would love to hear if you ever went back to that particular individual and said, <laughs> So between us, I'll tell you, I see them, you know, see them regularly. I mean, you know, that's the, that's, that's the thing about the profession. Um, and with, distance and a leveling of the power imbalances of that relationship. I'm actually, I'm far more generous about that exchange than I was when I was a graduate student, which is, here's the thing, the senior scholar was not wrong. Right. Um, there is a risk assessment to be made in choosing to do work that might be deeply sociological, but not considered professional. Mm -hmm. To the extent that the profession and the discipline have diverged, 
There's a way to get published. There's a way to uh, um, get your citation counts. There is a way to get promoted in the discipline. And then there's a way to think sociologically. And there has been some divergence, I will say there, <laughs> as generously, that's as generous as I can be. Um, and what she was counseling me was, was precisely that kind of nuts and bolts. If you want a job, this is the way this goes. Um, it was not that it was wrong. It was that you didn't know me well enough to know my assessment of the risk. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, there there's the sort of objective reality about this is how the profession goes. But then there's a real subjective interpretation about how much risk a person will take on. Um, and, you know, at the outset, I was uh, very gung ho about you had to hit both marks. You know, for a while I ran two careers, which was doing the sort of traditional um, academic publishing route and then, you know, sort of writing as a second career. Um, and I understood that to be the compromise, which is I got it. I needed to do both um, to sort of buy myself the legitimacy to do the other. Um, you know, that sort of, you know, that fades away again as you kind of get, as you kind of develop and as you kind of demonstrate that you are doing both. But yeah, the person wasn't wrong. <laughs> it is, I think, a really um, serious consideration, however, of what the discipline is going to be. Um, and again, so different from what I think people want from sociology. I think we think that by being, um, you know, pulling away from the sociological thinking and sort of, uh, uh, you know, foregrounding sociological method that we make ourselves more legible to power brokers, particularly politicians and funders. And my experience is just the exact opposite. I don't think they want an economist light when they bring in a sociologist. I think there are enough economists, right, for them to, they have economists that they could call in. There is something particular about sociological thinking um, uh, that lends something uh, to public discourse and to social policy and to the discipline and how we train students to think about the world um, that I hope is evident deeply in my work. Um, I hope that I model in particular that this can be done at sort of the highest levels of systematic inquiry, that you can do this work in this way. Um, and hopefully to rejigger the risk for people to do it, yeah. So um, it, this series is in part about conversations about purpose, right? Sort of our, our own purpose, institutional purpose, it sounds as if you entered this work with a pretty strong sense of purpose of how it would change the lives of individuals, uh, affect public policy. Is, is that something that you knew going in or you happened onto? Mm -hmm. You know, I like to think so, so much of memory is about structuring what a really divergent you know, interactions into a cohesive meta narrative that may, may or may not be true. So when I think back on it, I think that yes, that there was this process of sort of unfolding into purpose that happened during graduate school and then, um, you know, my first few years on the tenure track. I think my cohort in graduate school was so deeply influential to shaping um, my understanding of purpose. Um, but that's random, right? You don't know who you'll end up in graduate school, graduate study with. And so in, in you know, if, if I'm, you know, being more systematic about it, there were a lot of just sort of random moments mm -hmm. um, that probably met me on a part of my personal journey of purpose at just a right time. I don't know that I would have had um, the wherewithal to embark upon the type of career I've had had I gone to graduate school even four years earlier or two years later. There is a real element here of randomness. Um, having said that, I do think that my journey to purpose is, you know, just deeply aligned with the Black sociological tra tradition, especially. Um, you know, I was in Atlanta in graduate school, and so I uh, many times went over to the Du Bois archives at the Atlanta University Center and feel, you know, like many Black sociologists, a kinship, intellectual kinship with Du Bois. And in some of his uh, uh, papers, and I think in his first um, autobiography, the man wrote more than one, um, but in his first autobiography, he talks about um, wanting to be this really traditional, uh, they wouldn't have used social scientists at the time, but a traditional social scientist, but he said, how can I affect that kind 
of um, posture towards knowledge when black people are dying in the streets. How prescient and, um, and urgent and present that feels, right? That remains to me the black sociological tension um, that we cannot affect a sort of posture of being separate from the social world because the experience of being black in that world is so urgent. And I think that gives us a call to purpose in our work in a earlier and perhaps in a very particular way. And so I felt my coming into that purpose sort of being in that tradition. So unique to me, but I don't think unique overall. I, I think this is very common to uh, particularly minority social scientists who are struggling with doing the academic work, but also doing work that will matter to their lives. So uh, let's connect that a little bit to the, your work around lower ed. So first working yourself in the for-profit sector and then deciding to do this particular work. Is there, uh, from the outset, did you have a set of goals about changing that landscape in, mm -hmm. in doing that work? Um, or was it, this is a space I know and I can bring insight to it? Mm -hmm. So not the latter. I wish I could say I was sophisticated enough to go, <laughs> you know, there's a gap, I've got this unique perspective and here I go, not at all. <laughs> um, oddly enough, I resisted doing this project for about two years. Um, I, I mean, now it seems ridiculous, but yeah, for one, I thought, talk about the professionalization uh, piece of this. I thought my personal experience of the industry undercut my ac any academic legitimacy I would have bought, brought to the questions. I was very concerned about that for a very long time. Um, and in fact, in some of my earlier drafts and work would not even really discuss how I had come to this set of questions. I remember my dissertation advisor pushing me in a final draft to go, where are you in this? Where are you? <laughs> right? There's a reason you ask these questions this way and where are you? Again, very fortunate, I think, in that regard that there was someone who valued that enough um, to have me uh, foregrounded um, in my analysis, of, analysis eventually. Um, but I think what pushed me to sort of accept that this was the space I was in uh, is that there was a moment, yeah, when it was clear that if, I, that if I didn't do this work, there was a real sense that it wasn't going to be done. And that worried me because, again, my own social location, I knew these students. I knew particularly the women and the women of color who are disproportionately attracted to and targeted by for-profit colleges and universities. And the overall tenor of the research at the time was that what was happening is that institutional institutions and students were finding their level, right? That, that if you went to a low quality institution, it was because you had either low aspirations or low academic ability, right? And so there was a certain amount of buyer beware, certainly, but that the for-profit college sector was serving a really important function in that it was serving a student that just didn't belong anywhere else. Well, now for me to take that to its logical conclusion, that meant black women were by and large just too dumb to go to real college. <laughs> And so just as a person <laughs> who shared that social location, that seemed challenging to me. And I kind of really kept waiting for someone better than me, more senior, to take on that argument. And then no one did. And so I determined, oh, that must be what I'm supposed to do. Um, <laughs> uh, and I wanted to ask the questions in a way where the default assumption was the same one that we give other students when we do research about higher education, which was that they were rational, that they were rational. And really, if I, once I started from a point that the student population I'm dealing with is a rational population and having a rational response to a set of political economic incentives, my project became so vastly different than anything else that was happening in the literature that it really did become about if I didn't do it, it wasn't going to get done. And so there was a sense that just to the overall, you know, public understanding of students um, and of uh, a, a, a subpopulation that yes, that work mattered a lot to me to do. So in the, um, in lower ed, it's, it's clear that there is an indictment of the for-profit universities right, as an ecosystem, mm -hmm. but it's really a much broader critique of this gospel of education. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sitting here at Duke, right, we're in the middle of the gospel of education. And so flesh this out for us a little bit, because I think this is just, 
an extraordinary comment about higher education. Especially right now, I don't know that it's ever been more evident that what we really traffic in in higher education, particularly in more select selective institutions, um, is that we traffic in faith, collective faith, right? Um, and in fact, the you know uh, colleges and universities, and certainly the professoriates, start as a vocation that was thought of as being similar to priest in the religious order, right? But we also like to think we've become too rational for that. We've gone through the Cold War university. We've done the post-World War II thing. We were nice and rationalized. We'd separated ourselves from all of that. Um, And one of the, the, you don't realize you're a faith-based institution until there's a crisis of the faith. Yeah, right. So the think about like our overall theme today, when we talk about like the crisis moment, there is the actual crisis of the pandemic that is really just revealing a crisis of faith in social institutions um, brought about by the lack of economic mobility possible for people that the social institutions rely on. So what we sell to students is that we can transform your social and economic outcomes. We can divorce you, either divorce you from the circumstances of your birth or we can reproduce the circumstances of your birth depending on who you are and that we can do both really well. Well, that takes tons of faith on the part of the public to believe that that can be done. And we have for a long time justified that faith based on the economic returns to attending college. Well, by the 90s, this starts to break down, right? There is a pulling away of, uh, of people who have higher education, particularly graduate education, pulling away from the mean um, in the population, but there are fewer of those people, meaning it has become harder to become one of those people, get into school, to finish, to afford it, uh, to uh, earn enough returns to justify the student loan debt, right? All of that had transformed the actual measurable returns, the material returns to education, which I think led to a sort of public crisis of faith in higher education writ large. Um, uh, So uh, some colleagues at Indiana University have been tracking public faith in college or higher education um, by Democratic Party um, uh, doing a a large scale survey for the last few years, Um, Brian Powell and his colleagues there. And one of the things he shows uh, is how well um, how, how much this tracks to political polarization, tracks to the loss of faith in colleges and universities. Um, that to me is actually the real crisis. And we tried to solve that through privatization or financialization. Okay, so what the loss of public faith does is it undermines public investment. So public investment tracks to public faith. And as they decline, we fill in the gaps with privatization, public-private partnerships, investments, uh, portfolio management, et cetera, right? This is the business part. Um, As those things are inversely related, so financialization increases as public investment in faith declines, um, there are only so many tools available to us to respond to a crisis like COVID, right? Uh, Because we need people to just trust that we're going to do the right thing but we don't have the resources to do the right thing. And the incentives to do the right thing have been skewed for quite some time. That's what we're dealing with. That's what lower ed interjected. It interjected a set of politics, a set of economic relations that transformed the collective faith and investment in higher education. And that's not just true in for-profits. The for-profits are the extreme end of the spectrum. We have all been privatized, some from without, and some from within, <laughs> and that's where we find ourselves. Okay, great. So um, one of the things I love is your description of how, right, the individualization of this, right? So we are making independent decisions about our own trajectory. And, right, there's, there's very little uh, reason to have faith in that upward mobility. The, mm. the piece that, I, I would say I confront almost on a daily basis with students at Duke or students interested in a place like Duke are the identity dimensions. Mm -hmm. So a conversation over the weekend with a student who wants to go to law school, Mm -hmm. a very good Duke student, um, incredibly creative student, um, for whom law school seems like an orthogonal move in every way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. Um, And his explanation was, it would be good for my community to know one of us could. Yes. 
right? And my parents would be thrilled to this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so part of this individualization is it's connected to identity politics, mm -hmm. right? Students pursuing things um, both because they know or imagine there's a return, but also because they think it says something fundamental about who they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And about, so when you are from a minoritized community, uh, you know, you're not imagining that that is true, right? So every uh, minority community and majority culture uses avatars from their culture uh, as stand-ins for the cult for the, for the community's overall status and value, right? Um, so, like that student is not wrong, and in fact, I identify so much with the story. You know, I was when I took the GRE, I took the LSAT at the same time. I studied for both. Uh, I took the GRE because I had a waiver to do so. I had done this program at UNC. It was a preparatory program to prepare minority students who might have an interest in a PhD program. I had absolutely no intention of getting a PhD. What was that? I don't know what a PhD is. I know what a law, law school is. And I know what a lawyer does. And if you have grown up in a community where you are academically inclined as I was, um, uh, verbal as how my teachers would have called it. I was highly verbal uh, and I was a woman, right? You go to law school. There really are only five jobs for many minority communities, lawyer, doctor, teacher, accountant, engineer. Those are the jobs. Choose one and go forth. Um, and it is about, yes, your individual transformation of your circumstances, but about how it will reflect on your community and being that person in the community, representation, uh, and how much having a, a person around who looks like you can transform the imaginations of other people. Um, I end up going to graduate school instead of law school because someone who looks like me uh, Sandy Darity, a professor there at Duke, uh, says to me, you're too smart to go to law school. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant. I was like, what is, what is how is that a thing? That, that makes no sense. Right? But in wrestling with what he meant, I started for the first time to unpack what status and prestige and mobility meant in my own life. Very few of us have, frankly, that luxury uh, to make that call. But it is also true that the incentives, the economic incentives really are there to narrow the possibilities for some students to a significant degree. Um, student loan debt and rising tuition costs is probably second to identity and community is probably the greatest um, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, in, um, effect of this, that it so narrows what is possible for students to do because they not only have to become this person to transform themselves, they have to do it while predicting how much it's gonna cost them to get the degree. Um, so and that's what I mean about assuming the students are rational. There's a rational piece there um, that if you're gonna sit out of the labor market, if you're gonna absorb all of this risk of a profession that's really hard to pin down and to project where you'll be, then you have got to make some decisions based on the data you actually know. And you know a lawyer gets a job, or at least we, we think so. So part of it is also we haven't done a good job of telling them what the, statistics, the employment statistics are uh, in the legal field. <laughs> they are as bad as they are for PhDs. Okay, good. Um, all right, so how, if at all, has the past six months changed your own sense of purpose or your sense of higher ed. Um, as you know, right, you, you've alluded to this, lots of conversation about we need to think what this thing is. Mm -hmm. um, and accessibility is top of the list. Yeah. Um, so both you personally and your own sense of yourself, your work, and then higher ed, how are you thinking? It is so difficult to parse these things when we're still in the middle of the thing. And I really do think, by the way, I don't think we're even close to the end. I think we're dab smack in the middle. Uh, we've got at least by all reasonable projections of people who know these things. I've said from the outset by March, I was saying this is a two year process. So that means we're about month eight. So yeah, almost you know, dab smack in the middle. We of course won't really know until we have the privilege of hindsight. Um, what that has meant for me personally is a really doubling down on what it is I think my purpose is. I think that this moment, um, when it has become evident for the first time to some people, 
and even more evident for those of us who knew that our social institutions are frayed beyond, for many of them beyond all functioning. Um, uh, as my friend Roxane Gay has said in the New York Times a couple of times recently, no one is coming to save us. Um, that means those of us who feel committed to any sort of collective solution to social problems, I just feel a personal, um, you know, uh, mission-driven responsibility to double down on what it is I do best. Meaning, how do I find the everyday politics of how inequality is made and how do I make people care about it? That's what I do best. That's my job in the world. Um, and I'm really doubling down on that, which means so much more reading to the extent that, you know, anxiety and all of that will let me do it. Um, just trying to say, just trying to keep a laser focus on what is it I'm here to do. Um, as a profession and, and higher education writ large, listen, some of us, many of us will survive this. I don't actually think this is the end. It is the final bellwether, I believe, you know. We've been making these projections since the night, I think the first sort of higher education is in crisis book start in the 70s, you know, um, and it was really easy to make fun of that in the go-go 90s when it was like, ah, I remember they said higher education was done and look at us, we're growing by leaps and, well, we, they may have had the time horizon wrong, but the pattern spotting was really, uh, was there and was quite accurate. It just took a little longer for us to get here. This is, this is it, this is the moment for higher education, not institutions, I mean higher education as a field, to figure out what it is we do, um, how we're going to do it, and revisit our sort of moral, ethical responsibility to the faith that the public has placed in us. If we do not do that, if we come out on the other side of this crisis with millions of students and their families remembering that their institutions drag them off to move in for two weeks only to send them home sick with a to-go bag of granola bars. I mean, we cannot, this is a horrible lasting um, impression people will have of the institutions that we ask to put so much of their faith in. We cannot do this. I really do think that this is the beginning of a renegotiation of us earning and deserving the public's faith in us. Um, and, you know, I got to hope we stand a chance or else I wouldn't be doing the job. But it's pretty serious. It's pretty serious. And so I'm thinking about that a lot these days. Well, that's a fabulous call to reconsider and some action here. So um, before we jump into questions, I want to do the rapid fire round. All right. I'm just going to throw out some concepts, people, and just write a, sent a, a word or two on response. All right, but you're totally to blame for what comes out of my mouth, but let's go. <laughs> okay, the first one is good intentions. Is I rolling a word? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, good intentions, not enough. Not enough. Um, UNC going online. Too late. Too late. Uh, Jacob Blake. Yeah. Yeah. Eh. Eh. Silent Sam. Eh, kind of eh too. Eh. Yeah. Uh, Saeed Jones. Yes. yes. <laughs> Got one. Um, Kamala Harris. Eh. Eh. <laughs> Reparations. Yes. Yes. About time. Okay. Um, so what are you reading? Oh, that's a great question. I'm reading a book called A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door. I've actually got it here. I've got two things going on. A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door by Jack Schneider and Jennifer Berkshire. Jennifer is actually one of my absolute favorite thinkers about education. Uh, she tends to focus on K through 12, um, but is focusing on, she said to me, she wanted to do lower ed for K through 12. Um, I think this is a remarkable book. The other one I've got going right now, this is actually a room where I read a lot. So um, America's Experts, this is an older one, but Race and the Fictions of Sociology, because I am thinking about the narrative power of sociology, both the good and the bad that have come out of the discipline. So those are just a couple of things I'm reading right now. Great. Uh, are you watching anything? Are you a watcher? I do it in, I'm a, I'm a binger. So I can go weeks without actually even just turning the television on and then, you know, three straight days of, cause it's just how my work goes. Um, I finished the second season of the Umbrella Academy 
enjoyed it very much. Uh, I also like the HBO reboot of, um, oh, uh, the, uh, the attorney show, the classic. Um, Harry Mason? Harry Mason, yes. Yeah. It was surprisingly, I, have not, I had not read this in any of the press. It is a surprisingly feminist show. It is a historical narrative that does not uh, take the easy out on um, race and ethnicity um, and power and privilege. So most historicals, unless they are really talking about the quote unquote race question, usually really, you know, they imagine these uh, uh, mostly white histories. Um, and this, you know, there's a fully fleshed out Mexican American woman who's over the age of 40. <laughs> these, you know, there are uh, black characters that have an entire backstory. Uh, so it does an amazing job and is surprisingly feminist. I enjoyed it. Great. Um, and we've been ending each of these sessions with really the same question. And I, I realize this is going to be a fairly impertinent one for you. And it's about hope. Um, mm -hmm. Because I pulled a quote yesterday, uh, if there is a more persistent demand of the marginalized and the oppressed, then they perform hope for their benefactors, it, it will be difficult to find. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think, right, as we're exploring questions of purpose, this notion of a transformative hope that is action oriented, I think yeah. it's a really important one. Yeah. Uh, and so it, is there actionable hope that you would suggest for us? I was just about to say, my tension with hope is the hope that people want that absolves them of accountability and aspiration. There is a pragmatic hope that I think is as foundational to uh, the inception of the Western world and certainly the United States of America as is the idea of democracy because our democracy was founded at the same time that global enslavement was created and shaped. The two go hand in hand, the pragmatic hope of the enslaved uh, and the false promise of the democracy of this country. And so that kind of pragmatic hope is the kind that I traffic in. Um, and it's one that frankly, that yes, I think the majority of culture should probably get more familiar with than we would all be better off if they did. It is the idea that you will not always see the good ends of your good deeds, but you do them anyway. You do them anyway. Wonderful. Uh, let me open it up to the first question. On the question of rational actors, economists, often claim that people are not rational. Do sociologists tend to believe that we are rational or do you mean something different from what economists mean? Mm, no, I meant both actually in the, in the critique. Um, because of the work that I was doing, um, uh, I had to deal with economic rationality, um, mm -hmm. which you know we tend to make a punchline of sometimes I think in public discourse, especially those humanities people or other social scientists, but it, it, you know, in all fairness to that rationality, um, I thought it was a fruitful place to understand what the incentives were. I, however, had to go further than the economic understanding of rationality because that so much of that rationality is embedded in the individual. Well, I want to talk about structure and groups. So I actually couldn't stay at that level of analysis, but I do absolutely start there and hope that I engage that in very good faith. Um, and so, because in many ways, that's where my question started, which was if I assume that these people are rational in the economic sense, then let me take very seriously what the incentives are um, for their behavior. But I couldn't stop there because then it become, you end up in a feedback loop where you have an individual solution to what I was fundamentally theorizing was a collective social problem, right? That's, that's the economic rationality paradox. So yes, I started there, but then I meant a rationality more broadly, which was not only do individuals here have a set of rational incentives, but groups are responding to a set of rational incentives. For that, I was really borrowing um, um, from like stratification economics, which is in its own way is the sociologicalization, I think, of economic rationality, which is to say that, yes, you can look at individual metrics, but you can ascribe them to group behaviors. And in fact, you must, if you're going to understand how the inequality is, um, uh, um, is reproduced. So yes, I meant that and I started there. There was, you know, I think a direct good faith critique of the limits of how much that rationality could explain the problem. And then I tried to move beyond that to a more group-based bounded rationality. Okay, great. Uh, next one, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have many first year Duke students with us today listening in, living alone in dorm rooms and taking classes on Zoom. Uh, what wisdom can you share with this 
group of young people just starting their college journey? Well, wisdom uh, would be, I don't know about that. I don't, I'm not sure if I can say it's wise or not. That's, I think for them to say, I will say, I think and worry a lot about a lot of the things that will happen to you during your first year. I do worry about what this experience will do to your um, your growth, your intellectual growth, um, sort of your emotional attachment to the curiosity of higher education and learning that I think is so valuable and critical to the process. But I'd like to tell you what I don't worry about. I actually don't worry about you surviving this. I don't worry about your resilience. Um, uh, I may worry about that less than you do, in part because I really do think that from a, a, a bird's eye view of this, if you are here in your first week at Duke, you have the tools to manage and respond to these crises in a way that are not ultimately self-defeating, right? I really do think that has been invested in you. That's how you've gotten this far. Now, the issue is we as an institution aren't set up to help you figure that out right now under these conditions. <laughs> that means figuring it out with your colleagues, with your peers. I think this, um, this moment though of sort of disrupting the power imbalance of you know the experts, the professors, the administrators who are supposed to come and tell you what to do could fundamentally be a good thing. Uh, it is terrifying, but it's also empowering, but so is learning. So I think you're going to be all right, even if it doesn't feel like it in the short term. And good luck to you. I do worry about, I worry about you sleeping enough. I worry about if you're eating. Uh, I worry about you making enough friends, but I don't worry about you thriving. I really don't. That's great. Um, next question. I just finished a dissertation that was an ethnographic study of civic and moral for formation in a public high school in New York. Mm -hmm. And some of my other work focuses on the moral problem of school segregation. Mm -hmm. I worry that my work and so much of the conversation about education reform begs the question um, that what is education and ought to be is primarily for social and economic mobility. Given your analysis of the gospel of education, is there room for a way to imagine what education ought to be primarily for other things, personal development, socio-emotional development, individual communal flourish, flourishing, creative engaged citizens, or other such aims? Yeah. Right? How do we reinsert these other things That's into good. the gospel? That's the big project. That, 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 to my mind, if you come out of um, a sociology or education or uh, even like a political background that gives you an orienta orientation to education that includes both formal and informal learning um, and that sees it as a liberatory project or the potential for uh, being a liberatory project, um, this, is, this is the question. Like, how, how do you do this work that has to absolutely deal in the fact that we have a formal system of schooling, it comes with these inherited norms and rules, much of them embedded in the mechanisms of segregation, uh, exclusion and oppression and extraction, but also think that that doesn't mean that there's something inherently wrong about education itself or schooling itself. I actually think both of those things are true, probably as you do, uh, based on how you just described your work. Um, how do we reinsert them? You actually, you don't until, this is the political economist in me, you don't until you decouple the credential from the labor market. Uh -huh, which I don't know, you don't tell this to a whole bunch of higher education folks, but I'm sorry. It, uh, th that tight coupling has done a lot for the growth and the stability of higher education institutions, but we also see the risk of being so tightly coupled to the labor market. It means when the labor market no longer has as much use for our credentialing mechanisms, we also become a more vulnerable institution. That means that though as that crisis is sort of developing, that is an opportunity to reimagine college. This is kind of what I was alluding to earlier, that this crisis is a moment to reimagine what learning and education and college would be and schooling would be that is not so tightly coupled to those economic outcomes. Now that requires a state that's gonna provide that mechanism for us, right? That looks like, you know, whatever your political leanings are, but it does mean a state is gonna have to provide a stronger social safety net. But when it does that, then college or schooling gets opened up. There's a space opened up to think about it as a democratic project, to think about it as a liberatory project that, yes, will be more centered on um, 
the social and behavioral health and well-being of not just students, but of communities. But until that tight coupling has been addressed and something has filled the void of taking care of people's economic mobility and security, we're wedded to the discrimination of our credentialing systems. Okay, we may be waiting a while for that to get decoupled. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, next one, if you could wave a wand mm -hmm. um, and affect one change in educational policy, either in K-12 or higher education, what would you change? Anything you want. So it's going to sound crass, but talking about money always is. We've got to change. We, I would change how we fund public education. Uh, so we know what, so th there is the concern, yes, about what local, that property, funding through property taxes, et cetera, is what undergirds local control of schools. And we think that that is important to democratic function. I get all of that. I also know that it is the single greatest mechanism for the reproduction of social inequality in this country. Um, and so I, you'd have to, you have to decouple the funding of public education um, from the inequalities in housing uh, and residential segregation. Um, and so if I could wave a magic wand, we'd probably federalize school funding. I know, federalize school funding and, um, uh, and move to a, both a local and lottery-based school assignment system. Would you do something similar in the higher education space? Yes, and you're the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive to my audience, but here's the thing. I, I think that we all benefit if public higher education is the strongest part of our system. I really do. I think that private institutions even benefit, not the, you know, the, the small subset of the most elite, well-funded private institutions, because there are more private institutions than that. Private institutions that serve very specific needs in the higher education sector, the small Christian schools, the small liberal arts schools, the small working colleges that really do serve very particular needs, but don't need to be scaled, right? They're serving the students they serve. We, all of those institutions do better, not to mention minority serving institu institutions, historically black and tribal colleges and all of that, do much better if our public universities receive the lion's share of our federal investment and I would wave a wand to make that case. <laughs> We've got to get you that wand. <laughs> this is why no one would ever give me the wand. Can you imagine the chaos? <laughs> okay, great. I think this is a bit of a follow on. Um, how do we think about just support for something like Durham Public Schools during this difficult season? Mm -hmm. um, what are ways we can be thinking creatively? Mm -hmm. I, you know, on the show on um, Here to Slay, our show recently, we did a two-part series on higher education, on education, one on higher education and one on K through 12. Um, and we had on um, both a scholar and a community activist, and we had this question, like, yeah, what do we do, especially those of us who may not have children enrolled in school, um, but we care. And we're like, what, what do we do in this moment? And she, um, they said something that I don't think I've ever heard anyone say, that you may not have a direct mechanism right now to making the school system do what it should or what you would like for it to do, but that all of us, whether we have children enrolled in them or not, have a lot of influence over all of the tertiary systems around schools. Um, so the nonprofits, the funding organizations, those kinds of organizations that K through 12 schools really rely upon, after school programming, um, support services for students on individual education plans, um, the, uh, students with special needs, et cetera, that we actually do have more direct participatory influence on those things than we like to think that we do. So it may feel a little, uh, I said, how do we get around the, the per factor of a non parent Parent wanting to go down to the local school <laughs> and have a voice because it is it's a very weird dynamic and she said yeah you know we get that she's like I get that and especially now school board meetings aren't being held you know that kind of thing um, but everybody is holding the the financial meetings so um, and everybody and so all of us get to kind of participate in that I think um, as taxpayers and cetera and citizens who care about such things um, so I think this is a moment for both parents and non-parents who rely on viable public schools um, to do some coalition building and to try to push those sort of tertiary actors as much as we can to influence what happens in schools. Yeah, it seems that it's, it's a real 
kind of reclaiming of the public nature of public schooling. Absolutely. Right? Everybody's concern. And everybody's uh, paying attention for the first time in a way that hasn't been true in a really long time. Yeah. There's a real moment and an opportunity there. Yeah. Um, this is a slight change of direction. I recently began reading your book, Thick, and really appreciate your transparency around your experience as a Black woman transitioning through the different levels of academia. Mm -hmm. As a Black female PhD student at UNC, See, I often feel like I have to speak a little louder and push a little harder than many of my fears, but find myself holding back for fear of being seen in a certain way by faculty and peers. Mm -hmm. Can you provide any tips or speak to how you found your voice in academia and society? First of all, hi you to you. Say, say hi to me off this, by the way. Uh, and so... The first thing is, um, may not feel so good to hear, but I think that once we internalize it, we really are better off. And that is understanding that there is not a thing that you could do or not do that would shape people's preconceived notions of you. Literally nothing. I've sat in rooms where I was expected to be loud because I'm in this body, right? And not said a single word. I knew, and I would know because I was doing a little experiment and I would sit in a 90 minute meeting and not say a word. And at the end of it, everybody would go, can you believe what Tressie said? And I'll go, I literally never said a word. Or what we know about, about discrimination and bias and stereotypes is that they actually shape how people see and hear. So there's literally nothing you can do that can shape the precognition that is happening in someone else's assessment of you. So then that opens you up though. Here's the amazing thing about that. That opens you up to do what is authentically you. If it doesn't matter what you do anyway, <laughs> then you do the thing that is you, whether that's being quiet, whether that's not, whether it's agitating, whether it's not, whether it's doing this work versus that work. This frees you up, I think, to do what is authentically you. And my experience of being authentic is this. It will not resonate with all gatekeepers and all power brokers. It will resonate with enough of them. And that's really all you need. You need the people who can see you, who can hear you. And frankly, the more efficient you become at filtering out the people who were never gonna see you or be able to, to understand you and in, in the way that you understand yourself, the more efficient you become at filtering out those people, the earlier you develop that skill as both a professional and a person, the much better off you'll be. You'll be so much better off if you learn to identify those people sooner. And you can't identify them if you're not being authentic. Now, the, you know, you can always, uh, you know, sure, you know, there's some parts of the profession that we all have to kind of heed because power is a thing. Um, but I actually think that we have a lot more power to be ourselves than we give ourselves credit for. Yeah. Good. Um, next one. So how do you advise your own students, undergraduates and graduates, about risk? Mm -hmm. How do you balance giving students a realistic sense of employment possibilities and income while also encouraging them to explore creative paths? Mm -hmm. Right. And you have vast experience both in your current role, but also previously in your work in, in private enterprises. Mm -hmm. So that's where does the question? I actually I take my role. Um, I mean, you know, I think as we all do, but I I, I really do see myself first and foremost um, in relation to students. I think of that as a a a lifelong commitment to them. Um, even if we never speak again after they take my class, I think that the way I do my career, the way I live my life, is kind of part of a responsibility that I have to my students. Um, so I think about that a lot. And uh, people I think are often surprised. I know certainly many students are the first time they come and sit in my class and they realize that I do not care to hear about how they want to write an essay for the public. <laughs> <laughs> they think that you're not taking how to become trusty 101 because it's just not even, you know, it's just not even a thing. We're going to do the thing. You're going to learn the thing, right? I am an actual professor. This is an actual course. We're going to do the thing. And I say to them, I will not talk about this until you have done the work. I mean, right? That's just it. I do that because I feel obligated to give that to you. That's what I'm actually here to do. Now, beyond that and the relationships that we develop to help you figure out your life, I have, and it's, uh, it is, you know, an iterative document, but I have a document that I give out to students who want to do a mentorship, uh, a mentor relationship, or um, have me supervise a honors thesis or what have you, master's thesis. Um, and it is, uh, I tell them, this is how I think you might, you should think about risk. 
and it is a more holistic understanding of risk, I say to them, if you are a part of a family where your role in that family is a caretaker, no matter what they call you, you can be a caretaker in many cultures and communities without being a parent, right? Um, in some families, the son is responsible for these things, right? And I want to honor that. And I'll say to them, then these are some things you need to think about. You're bringing a family and a community along with you on this journey. But I, I, tried, to, I tried to translate um, uh, what I think are the, uh, you know, what I think is the hidden curriculum of the decisions of college and of this profession. Um, and then I say to them, and I can't help you answer any of those. I can help you identify the things that I think you need to consider. Once you are certain about what, what your risk evaluation is, then come back and let's talk and we'll talk some more about based on your risk assessment, the way I think the profession looks for you and et cetera. So everybody's risk uh, threshold is different. And what I try to do is empower them to determine for themselves what that is. And then based on that, if you come back to me and say, no, I'm fine burning it all down. Then I go, okay, well then let's talk about what that looks like. Uh, or they come back and they go, yeah, no, I, I, I'm responsible for God daughters. And, um, you know, uh, I take care of my grandmother or I have to think about these things. And I go, okay, well then, yeah, you probably don't want to think about that career, we probably need to, to look at this as a more practical option. Um, and so it's honoring that everybody's social location comes with a set of structures and that the student themselves is the best arbiter of what those are. Um, I can help guide them along, a set, you know, figuring out what those are, but then, and then once they're ready, trust them that they did the work to get that far. But we don't do that in 101. Nobody gets that until after you pass a class, until after you learn the basics. <laughs> okay, great. Um, next one, what impact do you think the current crisis in health and higher education will have on mental health uh, of communities of color? Moreover, do you have any thoughts on what more we can do in higher education to address the mental health disparities that already exist? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Abigail Sewell at uh, Emory University has this wonderful body of work about community risk and community mental health, race and racism and discrimination. Um, and some of what I have learned from her work um, is about how much this matters both at an individual level and at a community level. Um, and so higher education takes in, in individuals, but we're also part of a community and we create new communities even within that. And so I think those are kind of two different things. I think that we have a lot that we can do for community level health. For individual level health, we are actually really constrained in what we can do. We don't really like to say this, but it's true. We can make the best sort of um, environment possible to allow people to access the resources that they need. But that the bigger part of like individual mental health is going to have to be a larger project. You, we actually just need more healthcare professionals. We need more people trained. We need more points of access. We need different culturally responsive forms of um, healthcare. And a college and university just can't provide all of that. There are a couple of things that we can do. We can take seriously that there are people who are going to need them. And colleges right now have got various levels of uh, um, uh, skills when it comes to that. Um, but yes, this is as much a mental health crisis as it is a physical crisis. I think we're all feeling that. Um, you know, I cycle now through anxiety at these really rapid clips of, you know, uh, peaks and valleys. And I think lots of people are. Um, and this is what I think a systematic and a systemic failure does, right? It creates this sort of widespread mental health crisis. Um, and college and university is going to be honest about that, that there is no getting back to normal just because we can physically be on campus. Like even when that day does come, I think the, the lingering effects, kind of like the long haulers that they're talking about now who have COVID and who are predicted to have long-term health uh, consequences as a result, I think all of us are going to have a long-term mental health consequence as a result. Um, and it's going to show up both in uh, students and faculty and also in staff and in the communities where our universities are. Um, some of that we can control and some of that we're going to need a lot of additional investment uh, to respond to. Yeah. So thank you. And that was our final question. So with that, I just want to thank you for joining us and everybody else who zoomed in. This was really great to hear from you and uh, 
for anyone who hasn't read them yet, I highly recommend both Lower Ed and Thick. Please join us next month uh, for a conversation with Andy Del Banco on the purpose of higher education and a special thanks to the Kern Family Foundation. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. And, uh, yeah. I hope we can someday get you over here in person to meet your fans. I, I hope so too. <laughs> thank you everybody for taking time out of your day in the middle of a pandemic for this conversation. <laughs> and Suzanne and Duke for being wonderful interlocutors. I really appreciate it. Great. You have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.